So James, welcome to the Feel Better Live More podcast. Thanks very much, Ongan. Thanks for having me on. Not at all. So look, you have written this um, fantastic new book called The Energy Plan, and you've got none other than Arsene Wenger with a beautiful quote on the front there. Um, as someone who grew up as a football fanatic, Arsene Wenger is someone who I very much respected because he appeared to be someone, for me, who seemed to understand the importance of fueling our bodies in the right way to help perform. Um, how did you become a nutritionist in the first place, number one? But also then, how did you become a nutritionist for Arsenal Football Club, the French football team, the British, the English football team? I mean, how did that come about? Well, I guess we're going, well, you're almost right back to the start here, uh, Rongan. So this was, my career started really back in 2006. I completed my master's at Loughborough. And we were going for this time in the UK where UK sport were investing a lot into London 2012 to develop services for the athletes to perform better at the London 2012 Olympic Games. And after I finished my studies, I was fortunate enough to be recruited to, to be fast-tracked to work with some of the athletes at, you know, at those games. And I really went straight into a role with track and field, first of all. So my first role was with athletics, which I remember absolutely loving because it was such a pure way and a pure sport to work with. So my job essentially was to use nutrition to get the most out of athletes' performances. That might have been the explosivity of a sprinter and the strength and power demands, or it might have been an endurance runner. So I really sort of cut my teeth uh, in Olympic sports, moving to London 2012. And I was recruited by Arsenal in 2010. And I spent seven seasons there as their nutritionist and worked with Arsene Wenger in the first team squad. And my role at the club was you know, quite varied and I'd work very closely with the players, developing their nutrition plans and monitoring them, but also put nutrition within a structure within the club. So working very closely with a team of chefs, working very closely with other professionals, such as physiotherapists, doctors, and conditioning coaches too, alongside the players. You know, and as, as you mentioned, you know, I was very fortunate to have some great experiences in sport along the way uh, with England uh, in 2014 World Cup and in France 2018 World Cup. Have you always worked in sports nutrition or have you ever worked with uh, non-sportsmen as well? Well, I, th I think that's a really important question and a, re a really important thing to discuss today. Um, I set up my practice in 2014. So initially I was working very much at the sharp end in performance. And in 2014, I started to have more approaches from people with similar demands. So very busy, stressed business people, uh, performing artists in the West End who were going to do a show in the evening and having to fuel their bodies appropriately as well. And it was at that time I became really interested in transferring the science from the elites into other areas of performance. And that was when I started seeing more and more people. And over the last four years, this practice has broadened, and I now see people from a range of backgrounds, not just performers in the, in the classical sense, but also people who are you know, working in jobs in the city, for example, and people who are trying to get more from their workouts, and people who are just trying to essentially find a way to use nutrition in a sustainable way. So, so improving performance, uh, and I guess, for me, you know, what, what similarities are there between let's say the French footballers preparing to perform for 90 minutes in the World Cup final, mm -hmm. as let's say, if I've got a big day, lots of patients, maybe I've got a speaking event in the evening and I want my mind and my concentration to be optimal all morning, all afternoon and all evening. Are there any similarities at all that we can learn from that? Yeah, I, th I think there are, absolutely. And I think firstly, it comes down to how we're fueling our body. And let's start with energy. Let's start with, the, you know, the name of the book, first of all. And what we eat obviously has a profound influence on our energy levels. And one of the things that I've tried to do in the book, first of all, is that actually get people to understand how our body works. And the analogy I use is like, you know, our body is our own high performance vehicle. And our engine is essentially our metabolism turning our food in, into energy. And the premise for anyone I would work with is getting them to really understand how the body works and uses food as fuel. Because I don't know if you agree with this, Rongan, I think at the moment in the UK, we talk very superficially about nutrition. And I think where sometimes that's where some of the confusion occurs, because until we can really grasp how our body uses nutrients and foods, we're then just dealing in opinions. So I think it's for me, it's always really important to have you know, a good understanding of the body and the different fuels. And we can then apply it to a Champions League final, 
We can apply it to someone having energy to go to the gym. We can apply that to a busy family who's just had their second child. There's application in all these things. Do you think there's been far too much focus on food in terms of weight loss? Obviously, a lot of people around the country, around the world, are trying to lose weight. And therefore, food often is the first thing that people think about when they think about their weight. And I think when I was looking through your book, I think you said when you when you first started um, working in football, often players would be coming to you saying, hey, look, the boss has said I need to lose weight a bit. Um, first of all, is that true? And has that changed now? It's absolutely true. You know, going back 10 years, and this is almost going back to the days of track and field, it was very much, James, coach says I need to see you because I need to lose weight. That was the first comment. It wasn't a comment about reducing body fat. It was losing weight. And it's definitely moved on leaps and bounds within sports. And, you know, we're looking at nutrition and how it can affect how your muscles recover, nutrition, how it can affect energy levels, your immune system. But I still feel there's a disconnect in how we use nutrition within the general public because we have got this focus on aesthetics. Yeah. Absolute aesthetics. And whether this be weight on the scales that we're obsessed in talking about or whether it's now Instagram and everyone having this perfectly Instagrammable body, we're using nutrition in the wrong way. Too much of the focus is on the aesthetic and it's not about how we feel and it's not about using fuel to fuel our own performances. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think there's so many key points there. Uh, right at the start of that, I, I had a flashback to my youth um, and uh, you know, I used to... I used to fanatically follow Liverpool Football Club and right. John Barnes in the 80s was, was my idol. And I, I've got this memory, I've not thought about this in a long time, about I think I read something in the papers one day that actually um, his his manager at the time had said, you know, he's been eating too many Big Macs over the summer and he needs to lose weight. So that's going to help him perform better on the pitch. Uh, he'll get injured less. So, you know, that was in the 80s, I'm sure. So what, 20 well, a bit more than 20 years ago now. Yeah, right. Yeah, nearly 30 years ago, actually. Wow. <laughs> getting old. <laughs> getting old, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really interesting for me. But then I think I think the key point for me, which I, I really um, which I absolutely agree with, is this whole idea about what is food there for? Mm-hmm. You mentioned energy. Obviously, the name of your book is The Energy Plan. Yeah. And I've got to say, as a GP, one of the commonest complaints I get and my colleagues get each day is how can I get more energy? Mm-hmm. You know, I feel tired. I'm, I'm, you know, I, d- I don't have energy to do the things that I want to do, whether it's work, whether it's in the evening, whether it's at the weekends. So I think low energy is absolutely something people struggle with these days. And clearly there are many factors that can play a role there. But you're very passionate, aren't you, that if you fuel your body in the right way with the right foods, that can make a big difference to energy. Yeah, that's absolutely the case, Rongan, yeah. And, and, and it all starts from the food we're eating, and obviously the output is energy. And we're in January now, right? We're sitting here, we're a couple of weeks into January, and now is the prime time where we see a couple of things happening. We see people embarking on new fitness pursuits, so they're training a lot more than they, they ever have done. And normally also they're going on diets. And one of the things that we see at this time of year is we have to see people who are energy deficient who are walking around. And this is a topic that's covered quite a lot in the sports medicine press over the last few years called relative energy deficiency in sports. And it's something where you're expending huge amounts of energy, but not taking in enough and eating enough. And this manifests itself in lots of symptoms, decreased concentration, coordination, irritability, muscle strength, and it can have more serious uh, side effects too. But I can definitely see in my practice at this time of year, and all the conversations, people are jumping straight into new, a new approach to either lose weight or look better, as opposed to setting up a sustainable approach to fuel their body to then train harder, perhaps, and improve their fitness. It, it's the wrong way around. Yeah, no, I like that. Do you think some of us are, do you think we are training, well, not training too much, but we, we change things so suddenly that we maybe go from nothing to two or three spinning classes a week because we want to get fit and lose weight, but we're not proportionately increasing the amount of food that we eat because, you know, we're trying to lose weight, so I'm going to eat less, I'm going to work out more. Mm -hmm. Um, But if that's not done right, you're actually going to really suffer from low energy. Is this something you're seeing quite a lot? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%, Rongan. It's something that I think people view the two sometimes in isolation. 
and you know, and ultimately the two go absolutely hand in hand and in synergy. And it's just mm -hmm. about gaining an understanding of obviously training in the right amount, but fueling your your body in the right way. And part of the rationale really for for the book and getting the message across with energy actually came from sport a long time ago, and it came from working with combat sports athletes. And this is, includes people like boxers, judo players and jockeys because they have to hit a certain weight to get on the scales. So typically what we would see is a few weeks out from competition, suddenly they've really reduced their weight. So they have to hit that to get on the scales to compete. The problem that we'd see is, yep, they can actually compete. But when it would come to perform, they had no energy. Wow. So the one sort of key, key aspect of this really for me is, is look, it's, it's no good looking great if you don't have the energy to uh, deliver a performance. And I speak to people every day in and around London, in and around the UK, that you know, say similar things, that you, the focus is so much on looking good, it's almost seen as we have to go through this period of hurting, this period of feeling hungry. It's almost a rite of passage. This deprivation. Be. You have to do it, you shouldn't have to do it. It's yeah. not a trade-off. You can fuel your body in the right way with the right foods and still maintain the aesthetic you want it shouldn't be a trade-off and we've almost been taught it is a trade-off i think for those people listening who may feel but well, you know what james you, you've worked with these high level sportsmen who are performing on the world stage you you've you know dealt with ceos and top businessmen who are looking for high performance a lot of people may may be thinking actually that doesn't apply to me but i guess i would really disagree with that in the sense that we are all looking for high performance in our everyday lives, whether it's to perform well um, on the school run, whether it's to perform well in your relationships, whether it's to perform well when your kids are back home from school and you want to play with them and you want to do homework with them and you want to actually mentally engage with them. We need, we all want high performance. Uh, and I think sometimes the word high performance is associated with CEOs and sportsmen. But I think we all need to be thinking about high performance. We, we do. It's, uh, it was wonderfully put. And almost performance is a bit of a hard, scary word sometimes. And that's definitely an approach I've had, I think, early on transferring to, you know, to clients I would see on the street. They, you know, they would say the same thing about how does this transfer? And performance can be a hard word, but ultimately that's what we want. We, a lot of us, uh, most of the listeners and most of the people we see each day in our practices, they want to perform better in their jobs. We're now working longer hours in the UK. We have to perform better. We have to be fueled to cope with these increased demands. And you know, it's the same with our family life as well. And all we're trying to do really is to use nutrition to give our bodies the best opportunity to achieve what we can, our own personal best. So how do we do that? So, you know, let's say someone's listening to this, they're, they're interested in improving their nutrition, but they don't know where to start. And they've read... Um, conflicting blog after conflicting blog and they've seen one person do really well on a low-fat vegan diet they've seen somebody else do really well on um, let's say a, a diet low and refined and processed carbs mm -hmm. and they think well I don't know what to do I'm confused are there some basics that everybody listening to this can apply yeah I think there are I think that there are definitely some rules I think we really have to knock a few uh, myths on the head straight away wronger than that we shouldn't be following an approach that gets rid of any nutrient or food group that isn't something that's sustainable. That isn't something we do with our elite athletes. So the highest performers on the planet don't use that approach. What we do is we use different fuels at different times and we make this approach uh, sustainable. And you know, I think firstly, if we're diving into the science a little bit more, that you're right, there's been this almost debate in the media over the last, let's say last five years, it's really heated up in that, what's the best fuel for the body? Should we be all high fat? Should we be high carb? And we're constantly wrestling. And actually, our physiology hasn't changed much over the last 20 years. We use both of those energy sources as a fuel. Yeah. And actually, our body at different times prefers to use different fuel sources. When we're doing lower intensity work, walking around, our body prefers to use fat as its primary fuel. As soon as we're really increasing the intensity, maybe doing a hit class or doing high intensity running, we tend to see more of a shift towards using carbohydrate as more of a fuel. But it uses both. And if we feed it both, it means we have a healthy metabolism. So should you feed your body certain fuel sources at different times depending on what you're doing? For example, if, you know, if you've had a busy day at work and you're going to go and do, let's say, this spinning class or a, a circuits class uh, you know, in the evening on your way home from work, 
is there something that you should be doing to make sure that you can perform well in that class? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I really like the approach with that wrong as well, because we're almost going backwards from what we're fueling for, which is abs- absolutely the right approach. So we all need to think about when we're eating, it's not just eating, you know, in, in a sort of habitual way. It's mm. thinking about, OK, what have I got going on today? Um, what do I need to put into my mouth to ensure that I can sustain what I need to do today. And the reason I'm asking that actually is particular because in the last few months, my wife has started to work out more and she started to do strength training, which is not something she's she's really focused on before. Um, and I won't say too much more. Um, <laughs> so, get yourself into trouble. I'll get myself into trouble. <laughs> but essentially, she's really um, getting into strength training now a couple of times a week. But often she hasn't changed what her nutrition is for the rest of the day. And that's something she won't eat before she works out, sometimes straight afterwards she won't eat. And a few hours later, she can really feel tired, can't concentrate, feel a little bit irritable. And I see that in my patients as well, because I guess in some way, they've not thought about what do I need fuel for today? That, that's It's really well put. And we need to look at how we fuel our body over the 24 hours. And there's a couple of really important reasons for that. And just using your example with your wife and the strength training, we know that if we're doing a resistance training or strength training session, your muscles are still adapting over 24 hours later to what the workload that you put through them, which I think is quite amazing when we talk about it. it is. So we almost know that in the 24 hours after you've done this, this training session, what you eat will have an effect on how your muscles adapt. Wow. So, uh, you know, I think for me, that's really interesting. And, and how they recover as well. How they recover and yeah, and how, and how they grow and repair. And obviously the key nutrient we look uh, for for that is protein. And I've termed this in the book, the, the, the maintenance fuel. And it's something that we need to make sure we have enough of in our diet over 24 hours. But also now we've learned from the science that it depends on the timing that you have the protein during the day because our muscles are in a constant state of flux. They're constantly taking in new proteins to grow and repair and breaking down. So if we can get the protein in our snacks and our meals, it just means our muscles are constantly in positive equity, really. Protein is one that's obviously grown in the public interest in recent years and is really important because we know we have to hit a certain level over 24 hours to maintain our muscle mass and to maintain growth and repair for our muscles. So I guess... Working with elite athletes, I'm guessing that you have been quite specific with them in terms of how much protein they need. Um, Do you think that, you know, a non-elite athlete, um, someone who just wants to perform well all day and be able to do a workout three or four times a week, do they also, do you feel, need to, I wouldn't say obsessively, but do they really need to, um, you know, measure and look at how much protein they're having, or can it be a little bit more intuitive, do you think? It can be a bit more intuitive. I, I, I think with any of the things we're applying here, even eating for energy or your protein for maintenance, it doesn't have to be really rigid. We're not talking about weighing food. No. You know, that, that that's not the approach. Our elite athletes don't do that. Oh, really? You know, we don't weigh, f- you know, they, they don't go home and weigh their food. If there are specific examples where we need to be really prescriptive, yes, you know, we'll do that and we'll write a very, very sp- uh, specific plan. But in most cases, this is about getting the principles right with each meal yeah, and then replicating these over the day. And I think, you know, often, Ron, and I know we were talking about this earlier on, I think often we try and overcomplicate the science. And sometimes there's really some really cool, fun science behind what we're doing. But with the people who we work with, we want it to be dead simple so they can go into a restaurant or go down to the, the breakfast table in the morning and have confidence that they'll put the plate of food together and... Within the book, you know, what I've tried to do is we almost use this concept of building a plate and and how you build a plate depending on your demands. And so let's, let's sort of walk through then how one builds a plate because let's take, you know, a middle-aged man or woman who's working, let's mm. say. Uh, well, let's take, you know, let's take a, you know, someone who's got a busy home life. They've, um, you know, maybe they've got kids who they want to get to school, then get to work. And maybe at lunchtime, they want to go and have a little workout at the gym. So I guess, how would they go about thinking about building their plate? And I guess an additional question there might be, if they've got young children, are there any of those principles that, that they can also apply with their kids? Yeah, absolutely. I think I would start from the very beginning with this, Rongan. And I'd I, I really love to lean on an example and the, ra- and the rationale supporting this, because 
we, in every sports ground up and down the country, and this was the same for us at Arsenal, we would have your restaurant where your players would go and eat before and after training. And typically what would happen is when they go into the restaurant, the way that, that we set the restaurant up was that we had the different food stations with the different components, and we could then give some information to players on how they should build their plate. Now, the first station was always protein. So the players would go in and, and choose their portion of protein on their plate. Now, the second section was the fuel section, looking at the slower releasing, lower GI carbohydrates. Now, this would really depend. On some days, preparing for a big session, we'd be encouraging them to have a bigger portion of the carbohydrates. But on some days, we might be encouraging them to perhaps burn more fat or another adaptation. So we would say, actually, we want you to restrict the amount of carbohydrates and then move on to the next part of the counter, which is the protection foods which is the vegetables, uh, fruits and fats. So actually fill your plate with more of these vegetables to complete that component. And, and you call them protection foods. Why yes. do you call them protection foods? Protection foods to maintain tissue health, to maintain our immune system. and these Because what, the antioxidants or the phytonutrients that are contained within there? Yeah, absolutely so. And, and the vitamins and minerals too. You know, like, for example, looking at things like vitamin C, like you said, the antioxidants, folates, and, and the different vitamins too. And we often find that the protection foods, uh, the vegetables and the fruits, are often things that are overlooked on people's plates. We often focus a lot on, okay, well, I've got my protein, I've got my carbohydrate, I'm, you know, my set. And we often restrict the variety of these protection foods that have obviously a crucial role for our immune system, but also for our tissue health too. Yeah, I really like that. And it's really, um, it's fascinating for me to... You know, it's really fascinating to think about what might happen at a big football club like Arsenal. So the players are, you know, rocking up. They're going to eat before they train, let's say. And, you know, you've set it out like your protein station. And then well, what's fascinating for me is that sometimes you'll encourage more low glycemic carbohydrate type foods. Yes. But on other occasions, you'll sort of restrict that. Absolutely. Which is really interesting because obviously about five, ten minutes ago, you mentioned about not restricting foods. And I know... Um, this podcast has, you know, you know, uh, a very loyal listenership around the world, and there's a lot of different people who listen. Some people are advocates of a vegan lifestyle. Some are advocates of a low carb lifestyle, and have found that actually, if they restrict, you know, refined and processed carbohydrates and really go quite aggressive on that, for them, they seem to find that they can thrive in their everyday lives and lose weight. Whereas some people. Um, love a vegan diet and they find that that's changed their lives and i think for me the commonality tends to be when they've moved away from you know what's called the, the standard western diet to a more whole food based diet people tend to improve you know certainly yeah. initially no matter what change they make initially that's certainly what i found in my practice as well mm -hmm. and so what's fascinating for me is that sometimes your athletes who you're working with you will you know you will change their carbohydrate intake depending on what they're doing. So what, what can we learn from that? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you've summarized that really well, uh, Wongan, and that, yeah, it, it, and it really depends on what you're fueling for. It's the point you made before, right? That's so, the key, I guess. So it's, maybe it's the low-carb approach for some people in the context of the rest of their lifestyle and in the context of what they have previously done with their food intake. Maybe it works for them and their lifestyle, whereas somebody else, for example, it may not work for them. I, I think, I, I really like that. Well, it, it, it's, it all comes down to context, right? Yeah. It all comes down to context because everyone is, has different demands in their day. And, you know, just like you said, there'll be some, some days where I'll advise clients to have a higher protein, lower carb meal because, for example, they don't need extra fuel. So and, what, what might be a, a scenario where that might be something you recommend. So, so quite typically then, I mean, let, let's, we're in London now, let, let, let's dive into the city. Okay. And that's, you know, the typical person in the city, they might train three times a week. So on those days, we know that their body will need more fuel from lower glycemic index carbohydrates. And when you say that, just in case people who are listening to this aren't familiar with those, yeah. what do you mean by that? Oh, so things like basmati rice, wild rice, uh, whole wheat pasta, quinoa, buckwheats, uh, rye breads. Uh, porridge oats. You okay. know, there's a you know, huge variety of options uh, of, of these foods that we can choose. So quite broadly, we're saying, well, on a more active day where you're training more, you should have more fuel. But what happens on the day where you're going to work and you know one of those days where your days run away from you? Yeah. You haven't had a chance to go to the gym. We, we all have them. 
that's how we should be shaping our fueling accordingly. And it might be we get home in the evening and say, well, look, I actually haven't worked out today. My activity levels have been really low. Maybe it's time for me to have what we call in the book a maintenance meal, which is bringing the carbohydrates right down, having your source of protein and having your protection foods, your vegetables. But you don't need fuel if you're then going to be sitting around in the evening. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's a lovely way to think about things, about fueling your body for its specific demands. Exactly so. Um, and and I, I like that. And I guess with the book, you, you sort of outlined different approaches that people can take. I, I love that. That's a maintenance meal as opposed to, what, a performance meal? Well, we, the, the terms we use, uh, Rongana, we use uh, the maintenance meal and we use our fueling meal. And then for people who have extremely high energy demands, maybe you're preparing for your first London Marathon or your first triathlon, we would use a competition meal. But most of the readers who are just trying to get a bit fitter and trying to look a bit better and feel a bit better, we alternate between the fueling meal and the maintenance meal. And then you can look at the context of your day and then your week. And then you have the tools to adjust. Because I think too often we talk about nutrition, it's almost seen as you've got a blank sheet of paper, a static plan. That, that's not reality. That's not yeah. the world we live in. You know, we have to be nimble with our approach and have this approach that things may change. You know, you might have to go and do a show tomorrow, a show tomorrow night or work during the day. So your, your energy levels might be up. It's the same for the person who might you know, put an extra training session into their week. We need the, the tools to be able to fuel our bodies flexibly. But before we can do that, we need to understand. And I guess what you're trying to teach people is, yes, give them you know, an understanding of, of different fuel sources and what they're going to do for the body. But I guess the hope would be over time, they would start to understand what they need for their own bodies based upon the recommendations you initially make. Because ultimately, I guess we want to get to the point where we start to understand what we need for our own bodies. Uh, uh, you know, 100%. I mean, I was always taught within sport that we worked and upskilled the athletes. Your work as a practitioner, you would work with the talent, with the athletes, and you would teach them about their body. Essentially, we would coach them. It's yeah. like a coaching process. The coaches do it out on the pitch. My role really was to upskill, work with a chef to teach them how to cook, get them to understand how their bodies recovered, what an optimal level of a body composition was maybe for them as well. And then little by little, you take a step backwards. And you're on hand for the odd question. Hey, James, is you know should I do this? Or my muscle soreness is up. Is there anything that can help? But the autonomy is, you know, is passed then to the athlete. And it's, it's the same process with this book. What we're trying to do is to upskill people to take the scariness out of exercise and nutrition and say, look, hey, look, here are the fuels. Here are the different plates. Try them out. See how you get on. Monitor how you're doing and you can refine it. Yeah. And you're well, on a journey. I think on that level, it's just very... It's very empowering and simplistic approach in the sense that, you know, you've got all that experience. You have worked with some of the most, you know, high performing athletes in the world at the highest level. Yet we can all learn from those principles because I, I guess what you're saying is actually what you're doing with them and what you would do with, let's say, me if I came in to see you mm. actually is not that different. It's about figuring out what are you fueling for? Let me help you do that. Absolutely. It's absolutely the same. It's just often a different wrapper people have different context in their lives and we might you might face slightly different challenges but the science is still the same yeah our body still loses nutrients in the same way i'll tell you one thing you know just before we got recording today i was telling you that um i'm in london at the moment uh on a on a sort of book tour and right, really. every night this week i've got events in the evening so speaking about my book the stress solution and then i am you know doing a book signing afterwards and Last year, when my first book came out, I didn't have quite as many events. Right. And, you know, what? I'd be busy. I'd be quite excited about the event in the evening, you know, because I love speaking to people, love meeting people. And I found last year, what I would often do is I wouldn't get time to eat before the events because I was doing too many other things. Right. Too many interviews. And I, I realized that actually, what I would do at the I'd be okay doing the events and doing the book signing, but then I'd come back to my hotel and I'd be starving. Mm. So then I would eat late yeah and i wouldn't sleep very well and so i'd be exhausted the next day and you know just a just a simple thing that i've learned f between the last year and this year is now i sort of blocked out in my diary before each event a 90 minute slot where i will eat before i go Great. and it's a simple thing right it, it doesn't it sounds like so intuitive but and i you know i i'm sort of pretty obsessed with nutrition yeah right. um 
But I didn't really think about it. And having gone through that experience now, I'm now eating before all of these events. It, I think I'm performing better at the events because I've got a really nice uh, you know, source of energy throughout the whole evening. And also I'm finding that I'm sleeping better because I'm not eating so late. So that's just one example of how I've tweaked things from, from last year. And, and was it, did you notice that, that quite quickly? When you made that change and you said, right, look, I'm going to really focus on my nutrition before, was the difference quite quick? Did you notice? It was actually, if I'm honest. Mm. It was, I've been doing that maybe, well, I've done three events so far and I've got 14 to do. So I've still got a lot to do. And I've been trying before each of these uh, new events this year. It's actually about a month ago, I sat down and I thought, actually, it's a grueling schedule in January. Right. Um, I'm really passionate about spreading the word about what I do and trying to get around the country and talk to lots of people. But at the same time, if I don't look after myself, I'm going to struggle and I'm going to start burning out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I reflect on what I did last year. I've also noticed, if I'm honest, James, is that I don't know if, if, and I'd love to talk a bit about food timing. I know for me, I know for many of my patients, if we eat late, it can often have a knock-on consequence in terms of our our sleep, so therefore our recovery. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of um, Professor Sachin Panda's research from the Salk Institute in San Diego. He talks a lot about time-restricted eating and how we've got natural circadian rhythms and actually eating in harmony with those can be really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why do you ask, did I notice the effect quite quickly? Well, because typically I'd expect you to say yes, really. And I think often there's a misconception with nutrition that you have to turn your your diet upside down or your nutrition upside down to see an effect on your performance. But actually, just changing one meal and seeing how that's gone can have a, a massive, massive difference. We had um, we had an event a few weeks ago. This was over at the Barbican with uh, a society of musicians. And I think within the music industry, nutrition still in its infancy, and they were saying, look, what's the one thing that I can change to have an impact on what we do in the evening when we're performing all around the world? And it's getting your pre-performance routine nailed. And I said, I said, okay, everyone, put your hand up if you know what you eat or what you prefer to eat before you go on stage and what time it is. How many people give that some thought? 30%. Wow. You know, so just with one, one small intervention around what you're eating before and maybe what you're drinking, if you're having caffeine, anything like that, you know, you can have a huge impact on the most important part of your week, that performance on stage. And it's just a small tweak. It's, what's incredible is that when you put it like that, it's obvious, isn't it? You think, actually, you know what? I'm a musician. I need to perform now for a couple of hours in the evening. Well, what do I need to do? What do I need to fuel my body with to ensure that I can do that? But for some reason, we don't think about it mm. like that. Um, you know, this was recently, you said that was with musicians. That's right, yeah. Um, one thing we spoke about before we came, you know, to record today is I've always felt that, um, you know, Premier League football seemed to be, you know, certainly 10, 15 years ago, seemed to be a little bit behind the curve in terms of nutrition. They seemed to be focusing on a lot of other things. Mm. That Certainly that was my perception. Obviously you, you're in it and you've been in it and probably one of the pioneers, I guess, in it in terms of working with, Arsenal, because Arsenal are well known for actually, I think Arsenal Wenger is very well known for sort of being slightly ahead of the game in terms of trying to introduce these ideas mm-hmm. into the club. Um, and it really does strike me as quite bizarre how we, we've not really thought about food in that way, have we? we we've just sort of, oh, we, we eat because we're hungry or, or we're not hungry. It's just a thing that we do. We've not thought about what we're going to put in for what we're doing afterwards. It's our habits, as you know, especially in London, are based on habit. You know, we, we tend to wake up in the morning, we'll have the same rushed re- breakfast, perhaps, go to that sh- same coffee shop for the same sandwich, finish work, perhaps scramble around at the local supermarket to prepare our meals. And it is, it's based out of habit. And one of the ki- key things we're trying to do with the book, really, is just to break habits and say to people, look, this should be conscious. And we should be tailoring our nutrition. It doesn't have to be obsessive. It just requires a little bit of thought, you know, and, and how by making a few simple changes to our nutrition, to our energy plan, we can, you know, achieve a bit more and, and have more energy to do the things we love to do. So weekends, um, a lot of us, if we have, you know, obviously working patterns are changing a lot now, but yeah, many, many people still have, you know, let's say a, a typical Monday to Friday uh, office job, let's say, and they're not working at the weekends. So... 
obviously they might just be completely chilling and relaxing at home on a Saturday or let's say to another extreme they might go out with their family or their partner and go hey we're going to go for a long walk we're going to go out in nature and go on a little bit of a hike mm -hmm. so I guess a lot of us will have the same breakfast on a Saturday morning without any thoughts mm -hmm. but I guess what you're saying is that depending on how we're going to spend that day that will also then um it will also influence the sort of breakfast we should be having. Yeah, I, I think so. And again, it just comes back to the, the premise of we're fueling for the, the demands of that day. So, so if you are having a quiet day at home, mm. is that and you know you're not going to be particularly active, is that the sort of day where you might want to have one of these sort of, um, you know, protein-rich meals, which are relatively low in carbohydrates because you're not going to be expending that energy through the day, as opposed to when you're going out for a three-hour hike, let's say, you might go, actually, I'm going to have more of these, hopefully, whole food carbohydrates in the morning with my breakfast. Is that is that the sort of thing you're getting at? Yeah, absolutely. I think if we're around the house each, you know, each day, I think more of these maintenance meals, you know, the higher protein, lower fuel type of meals would, would definitely fit. And then we know that if we're going to go out for a big walk with the family or we're doing a couple of exercise classes or on the golf course, we need to add more fuel. So we might have a couple of fueling meals in our day to, to help support that as well. Do you talk about how our food can impact our sleep at all? in the book is that is that one of your focuses or is that something you've seen in your practice yeah i mean it's I'm, I'm sure you see the same thing it's a massive question isn't it and huge and i think probably in our roles we're, we're trying to frame the context to people because you know i remember going through sport for years you would have players athletes coming to you normally the day before a match and saying look i, I just can't sleep and it has a massive effect for them because obviously you don't get a good night's sleep you know your things like your your performance your physical cognitive performance goes down so it, you know it's a, it's a big area for people but I think linked into this I think there's principles around sleep hygiene and also getting the basics done really well around sleep and I, I think with nutrition and that's the same with the whole book here it's about doing the basics really well and often sleep's one of those areas I think where we can reach for a new potion a new pill without getting the basics done thinking it's going to overcome all of our other sleep hygiene principles and that that's really not the case i think i think we're all sort of a bit hardwired as humans to look for that quick fix we're looking for the hack right the hack what's the new <laughs> thing that's going to sort my sleep out and it's incredible um i i i sort of i've written about sleep lots particularly in my first book um although i cover it quite a lot in in the book on stress as well because i think a lack of sleep is one of the biggest stresses on the body mm. in terms of you know what it does you know you your cognitive function goes down, your ability to make decisions goes down, uh, your ability to concentrate, even hunger hormones and appetite hormones get flipped Absolutely. when you're not slept. So, you know, you feel hungrier and you feel less full, which is you know, a pretty disastrous combination if you're trying to, you know, limit what you're eating, let's say. Um, and I find that in my practice when I talk to people, even if they've read some of my work and I'm often just going back to the basics and, and it works for the majority of people because I, I find with sleep, and I'd be interested as to whether you found this with your athletes and with your clients, um, in the majority of cases, they're doing something in their everyday lifestyle without realizing it mm -hmm. that is negatively impacting their ability to sleep at night. Um, and it often takes just a few small tweaks. Is that something you've seen with your athletes? Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. There's almost one outlier, isn't there? There's one, let's say, red flag. And part of our role generally is, you know, you work with them and understand, is there anything out of the, out of the norm? I mean, how do you deal with, um, you know, your athletes, I guess, would travel a lot for competition. So you were with Arsenal, so they were in the Champions League for, for a lot of those years, if not all of those years. And yeah. so, you know, that would be midweek games for the players in a European country if it was an away game sometimes with a time lag, yeah. um, maybe two hours, three hours, maybe sometimes even four hours, I imagine, depending on how far they're going. Um, how, you know, how do you manage that as a nutritionist? Is that part of your role? Uh, it, it is. I mean, and this would be very much, a, you know, a team approach as well. So it would be, you know, it would be the doctor, myself as a nutritionist, uh, probably a conditioning coach too, looking at all the different aspects around the player's performance. And Ultimately, it comes down to being quite sensible, you know, because one of the things that we would find with our athletes uh, is, let's say, a Champions League match. You might go and play away in Croatia, for example. You might be on a, a, a flight that's over three hours. 
and and often the match might finish at let's say 10 o'clock by the time you've left the ground and got clearance to take off you might not be wheels up until let's say 12 30 past midnight past midnight and then you're in the air because you're flying home so you you might not get home in your bed until around 4 a.m that's quite common for for champions league footballers sometimes so like for us this is one of these like questions that we need to answer and this will be the same for business people right because a lot of the business clients i deal with as well if you've got to go halfway around the world for an important meeting you've got to go and do that meeting you know that is the most important thing but it's how we can put things in place to help buffer that and i think one of the things we just got to be really practical in terms of the next day just using catch-up sleep yeah you know and how we're banking in time to then regain any any sleep lost before even looking at nutrition what what basics you know again we're back to the basics aren't we what basics can we do really well to allow our players or our business people to recover yeah it's interesting one thing i want to move on to is jet lag because Mm. i know you talk about that a little bit in your book and you talk about the basics and you've also got this list towards the start of home essentials. That's right. Which I found really fascinating. So first of all, you know, can we talk about these home essentials and why it's so important for you at the start of the book to actually make a list? Yeah, I think so. This really comes down to managing your own environments. And in the book, I've termed this your, your winning behaviours because often I think we embark upon a new programme or a new change and we haven't got everything that we need. So, for example, if we're going to look to exercise or, you know, or train more, even just having trainers or our running kit to go and do so is quite important. But likewise, how we're eating at home, do we have the right crockery, the right glasses, um, the right ways to serve food? Because, you know, one of the things that we know is that how our food is prepared and set out depends on how we will eat and how we will enjoy the experience. So one of the things that I always say to to new clients is get these things set up first of all because once you have these in place you're then in a position to move forward and make some and make some wholesale changes are there well i think there are a few surprising things on that list yeah please dig in yeah i want to see if i can find it um but in that home essentials list there was something about was it a protein shaker from recollection yeah that's right hold on i've got the page now it is a uh, yeah a protein shaker Mm -hmm. i was right um so are you a fan of protein powders? I think they can play a role for some people. I, I would never advocate in, in an approach that you everyone has to use a protein powder. But one of the things that we can see is that they can provide a convenient source of protein, maybe when you're traveling and you haven't got a source of protein to hand. So they can almost fill in these gaps. And I think that's the way we need to view these uh, th- you know, things like protein. Because we're talking about a supplement now. Yeah. And that's exactly what it should do, supplement our food intake. Yeah. Not be two shakes a day, a meal replacement. We're, we're, we should be always food first with our approach. Food first. So you're using that as, as something in case people are traveling or they're maybe on the go and they haven't got time to cook a, a fresh meal. Maybe something like that's potentially now and again. Absolutely. As a contingency. As a contingency. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that's super useful, actually. And just, I don't think we quite covered this before, but for people listening who are wondering what are those benefits of you know, I was going to say increasing your protein intake, but I guess mm. it depends what your existing protein intake is. When you've got the right, um, the, the optimal amount of protein in your diet for your lifestyle, what benefits will you get from that? Well, one of the first benefits is that you'll maintain your muscle mass. So if you're doing some resistance exercise in, in the gym and you have enough protein, your muscles need that to be able to grow and repair. So you're maintaining your mass, but also another really important one is not getting so sore at times as well. So your your muscle proteins are helping to maintain them, uh, maintain and repair the muscle mass. And there's no other place really to look than this, than other than in the final chapter, the aging chapter with old age, and obviously the, the problems we see in this country now with sarcopenia. Absolutely. You know, and the, and the muscle loss with age and. If there's one area where protein is a focus, you know, it, it's in that population. But I, I appreciate I might have just, uh, you know, jumped ahead slightly. There. No, no, not at all. I think it's 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 very important. I, I've I've sort of spoken about this, written about this on many occasions. That um, you know, once we once we hit thirty, uh, once we get past the age of thirty, we are many of us, if we're sedentary, we're losing a significant amount of muscle mass mm-hmm. each year, and muscle mass is is a key predictor of our longevity and how how well we're going to be as we age. Something we see a lot as doctors is um, elderly populations who are not eating enough protein. 
to maintain whatever little muscle mass they may have, they're really low on their protein intake. Is this a population you have seen much or not really in your work? Increasingly, yeah. Really? Over, the, over the last four years, with it within my private practice, uh, a lot of people generally who are 40 plus who are going into a different stage of their you know their life you know the the athletes are one level but i think the people who come into the practice have, have got families and they're looking to set up their health to be able to again back to this word perform perform optimally in their later years i mean just a couple of weeks ago i had a lady who came in who, who was brilliant she was aiming to run her first london marathon at the age of 66 and her first wow. qu- question was james can, you know can i do this I said, absolutely you, you know, you, you, you absolutely can with the right training and the right nutrition. But I think most importantly, with the right mindset. And one of the things that I've, I, I felt really important within the aging chapter and with these clients is the aspirational message is really important. Because I think if we resign ourselves to, well, okay, I'm getting older now, so maybe I should sit on the sofa more. You know, maybe I should restrict the amount of training I'm doing. You're resigning yourself yeah. to aging. You're not fighting it. You have to stress your body in the right way. And, you know, we look at some of the examples of people who have excelled. There's marathon runners still running incredible times into their 60s, 70s and even 80s. So it's entirely possible. But I think it all starts. It all starts with that aspirational message that this is for you if you're 40. This is for you if you're 50, 60 and 70. That that is an aspirational message. Um, A a guest I had on the podcast maybe about 10 episodes ago or so was a a chap called Rich Roll, an ultra endurance athlete in in America. Oh, brilliant. And he started off his life as a corporate lawyer. He was a college athlete, always sort of performed pretty well, um, but really let himself go with his lifestyle, um, sort of would drink a lot of alcohol. And he really turned his life around when he was 40 because he had some sort of chest pains. Um, and he, he really, that was that was a big wake up call for him. Right. Um, you know, that, that's a real summary of a very exciting story, which I did go into in a previous episode with people who want to listen to it. But What's incredible is that he posted recently on his Instagram that he has, um, I think he's maybe sort of 53, 54 now, something like that. Rich, I'm sorry if I've got your age wrong. Um, <laughs> but, but essentially saying he's never been in better physical condition as he is now. Mm-hmm. And he, he uses that to really inspire people and go, actually, you know what? A lot of people would have thought, actually, you were probably fitter as a teenager or in your 20s. But he's showing by making those intentional choices with his lifestyle. And for him... Okay, for him, he chose to go to a whole food vegan diet. Mm-hmm. That was him, and it seems to work for him. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm very, I try and be as diet agnostic as possible. One of the reasons is, is because, as a doctor, I see patients who come in who've got all kinds of different preferences, yeah. uh, cultural preferences, um, ideological preferences on what they choose to do. And I don't really want to judge people. I want to help every single person who comes in through my door. Um, to fit a lifestyle around what they want and their goals. And, and I get the impression with you also from what I've seen in the book is that you know, your approach is just as applicable to a carnivore as it is to a vegan. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And I really echo your message there, Rungan. And I think there are tons of different ways that you can use nutrition to get the results. Essentially, my job is to provide the right principles and the right guidelines. There's obviously a multitude of different foods that you can choose based on cultural preferences, based on other dietary preferences as well. You can still achieve the same result. It's, yeah. it's it's just about applying these principles in the right way. So I, I'm exactly the same as you. You know, I think we have to have, you know, a real respect for people's for people's choices. And you know, my role is really to help them work within those to achieve uh, to achieve their goal. I, I love this idea of performance, and you mention it now with with respect to longevity. And you know, that people who listen to this podcast as a whole variety of ages. I know there's some teenagers now who are listening, but Brilliant. I've also got people in their 60s and 70s and and the whole range in between. And I guess, you know, depending on what you want out of life, we need to think about, well, if we do want to live to a ripe old age, how do we want to be performing when we're 60 or 70? What do we want to be able to do? Do we want to be able to, you know, go to the shops and, and buy our shopping and two big heavy bags in each arm and carry it home or carry it up a flight of stairs? And I guess if we want to do that, we need to think about what sort of fuel we need. We need to think about our muscle mass and how we're going to preserve it and our mobility so that actually when we get to that age, we're going to be able to perform. Mm-hmm. Very much like this 65-year-old lady who wants to run a marathon for the first time, which, yeah. again, has she done it yet or is she, is she training to do that? She's training to do that now, but she's making wonderful progress. And you know, I've no doubt that she will. And I think every time you speak to, whether it's her or a different client, 
you know they they smash through these boundaries and and often they say oh yeah i can i can definitely do this i, I don't know why i was doubting it so i guess the wider point is we're all capable of a lot more than we think we are at any age at any age and there are many components to look at. You mentioned mindset, of course, mindset's very important. But obviously your approach as a nutritionist is let's get the food right for what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I think that's incredible. I do want to talk about caffeine because yeah, there's a couple sure. of reasons for that. One of them is that in your home essentials, in your list of home essentials, you talk about a coffee capsule machine to understand your caffeine dose and timing and keep it consistent. I think there's a lot of themes in there that I just love to explore. Caffeine is a psychoactive drug that much of the world love and, um, you know, a lot of the world are probably slightly addicted to, I would yeah. say. <laughs> um, let's talk about caffeine and how it plays a role in our performance and why you're so specific in your home essentials about knowing your dose. Yeah, I mean, we've got lots to talk about here. We do, <laughs> for sure. Uh, you know, so, you, you know, as you've just said, you know, caffeine in terms of you know, what we say as an ergogenic aid, something that can improve your cognitive performance, your alertness, but also we've got really good evidence that improves uh, your physical performance by up to around 8%. So I think sometimes I meet people for the first time and they say, they start an approach and they say, well, I'm off the caffeine, James. That, you know, that's good, isn't it? I said, well, no, I think that, that really depends. Oh, oh, you know, I can still have caffeine. And I think the way we tend to unpack this is that it really just comes down to the principles we said before, often the type of the caffeine, the timing, and your total amount in the day. And one of the things that I would say, first of all, Wongan, is if we look on the high street, the actual amount of caffeine that's contained in our coffee varies wildly. I mean, I was amazed when I, when I first did the research around this. And we, you know, we just saw that actually the published data shows that it can vary from anywhere between, let's say, 70 milligrams in a cup right through to 300 plus in a cup of coffee. Hold on, that is, an inc I mean, that's almost, uh, well, four and a half fold almost difference. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, so you get a coffee from one high street chain, mm -hmm. you're eating, a, you're, you're getting a certain dose yes. of a stimulant. Yep. You go to another chain because you're in a different office that day or your your route is slightly different. Yeah. And you could be getting three or four times that dose. Yeah, absolutely. And this will obviously be dependent on the size of the coffee as well. But yeah, absolutely. We, we know there's a huge variance. Now, we never do that with, let's say, a medication, right? So mm -hmm. if we were taking a prescribed medication, we wouldn't jump around the doses three, fourfold. No. So is there something, I know my private thoughts on this, and I'll come to that in a second, but is this sort of wildly variable dose of caffeine that many of us are consuming from day to day mm -hmm something that can cause us issues yeah I, I think so i think unknowingly especially let's let's take the work setting first of all where you know you might have your coffee after breakfast in the morning you know you might have another one after lunch suddenly it's a busy day and you dip into one mid-afternoon suddenly that your caffeine intake during the day especially over periods of high stress is creeping up and creeping up and your your caffeine intake each day is, is creeping up with that but I think probably the bigger thing here is, it's just like, like we said with the fuels earlier on, we need to have an understanding about caffeine because its effects can be potent in a good way, but also it's a massive double-edged sword. Yeah. You know, if we're looking at, you know, I think one of the examples we described off air before is caffeine and sleep. If suddenly you're going through one of those periods with work where you've really ramped up your caffeine intake, really sort of without knowing just to get through, and you're wondering why your sleep's fallen off and why you're gradually, your energy levels are dropping, then th there's the link. Isn't it, it is such a huge sleep disruptor. And, you know, if people have got away with it for years and they mm. don't think it's affected their sleep, they're very resistant to the idea that caffeine might be responsible for it. Yeah. Um, and it, what's interesting for me, actually, is that two sort of world-class re researchers who I've had on the podcast before, um, I mentioned Professor Sachin Panda, where we talk about time-restricted eating. He... Yes very much uh, sort of is very careful about his caffeine intake and at least once or twice a year he goes off it mm. to reset his sensitivity and he, and he says when he does that he's more productive actually weirdly enough and he sleeps better I think Matthew Walker who wrote the book Why We Sleep who I did a two-parter with as well on this podcast um, he doesn't drink caffeine anymore based upon his research so nice. I guess it's in the context of what he wants to do and what he wants to achieve mm -hmm. what I think is really important about caffeine is that we forget what a long half-life it's got. Yeah. And 
you know, in my first book, I make the recommendation, enjoy your caffeine before noon. That's something I find useful for my patients. Mm -hmm. And and this whole thing of dosing caffeine is something I I got a little bit obsessed with last year because I, I started to drink quite a lot of coffee. It was my crutch. I'd use it when the pressure was ramping up, when I had a book deadline or when, you know, I was flagging in the afternoon, I had more patients to see. Yeah. Um, and I recognized, I could tell that it was making me a bit anxious and less calm and level-headed. And what really helped me is actually forgetting to, I wouldn't buy coffee out. I'd actually weigh it at home. I'd actually make it in a cafeteria every morning. Right. And I would obsessively weigh. And I knew then what dose I was getting each day. Mm-hmm. And that's how I weaned down as well to a really low dose. And I knew, okay, I've got my hits today. And I noticed that I was much better and stable when I knew how much I was having each day as opposed to this wildly variable amount. Do you use caffeine to enhance performance with your athletes? And how do you do that? Yes, in answer, yes. But it's not a blanket approach because, as we know, the sensitivity to caffeine varies wildly. Yeah. So it's something that, like all of these principles, needs a bit of exploring in situations that aren't high pressure, not before a job interview, not before a Champions League final, you know, right. si- situations where you're nice and relaxed and you can see and see your response. And going back to your point there about understanding your dose, you know, that, that's exactly the principle we're looking at from the book and just have a, a bit of an understanding of how much, let's say, a pod for a coffee machine, if that gives you 60 milligrams, okay, you can start to have a constant then. And how do you feel during the morning? What's your energy like? Rather than jumping around to different high street, uh, high street coffee chains. Yeah, because then that person comes in and I say, how many coffees do you have a day? They say, oh, I have, I have two coffees. Two coffees doesn't really mean anything, does it? Because it doesn't mean anything. We've got just no idea what's in that, how much caffeine is actually in that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know um, at various gyms I've trained at before, some of the, um, some people who are really you know, into their fitness and weightlifting would actually dose caffeine about 30 minutes or so before their workout mm-hmm. so that they could uh, lift heavier. Now, there is some research on this, isn't there, how caffeine impacts our performance? Yeah, there is. Yeah, there's actually quite a lot of research, I guess, in terms of what we call, again, a supplement that would have an effect on performance. The evidence behind caffeine is is very good. You know, typically in terms of peaking in the blood, you take it anywhere between 45 minutes an hour to, to get that peak while you train. So, you know, going back to your question with athletes, You know, we look at the timing of when they would take it, normally around the start of their warm-up, you know, just to make sure that it's peaking at the right time. But that's the same for the business people too. You know, it's the same for, for example, if I'm having coffee before I'm coming down here to talk to you, you know, I might have it an hour before. So that it's working when you need it to work. Exactly that. And I guess, you know, this is probably something that I'm interested in i hope my listeners are as well but (laughs) let's say for example you've got a footballer a premier league footballer who um is training throughout the week training in the gym they're training they're doing the the drills with the rest of the team Mm. i guess you might use caffeine in the morning let's say at the right time so that they're going to optimize their performance and focus in their training session yeah, that same person might be sensitive to caffeine. It might be a sleep disruptor if they had it in the afternoon or the evening. Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing you might be in the scenario where actually, let's say they've got a 12 o'clock kickoff game, mm-hmm. right, uh, on Saturday lunchtime for the, you know, for, 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 the, for the televised game. You might be okay using caffeine, let's say, one hour before they perform. Um, I'm assuming caffeine's allowed, isn't it? It's not no, a... Uh, that's right. No, yeah, caffeine's, caffeine's allowed. <laughs> Just checking, <laughs> so, yeah. So... But it might be a different bit of advice if they're having a Champions League game and they're performing at 8 p.m. that evening because, yes, it might help them perform in their game, Mm. but the double-edged sword is it might negatively impact their sleep that night and therefore their recovery. Is that something you have to tweak sometimes? Like like your footballers can have caffeine for a 12 o'clock lunchtime game, Mm -hmm. but you maybe wouldn't recommend it for an evening game. I think absolutely we would definitely tweak. Yeah, we would definitely make tweaks to that because like you say, again, we're, we're back to this word context, aren't we? Yeah. And, you know, for them, if, if for example, a bad night's sleep, if there's another game in two days, you know, what's the effect of this, if this lack of recovery time? And again, this this is the same question that's being asked in the West End night after night, you know, for the musicians who are, who are on stage or people who are working in studios. It's how that, you know, we can get the right balance, you know, with our caffeine to... You know, improve our cognitive function, but n- without tipping over the edge. And it, it just, it really takes a lot of practice. And I think one of the things that I would say, 
with all of the aspects of nutrition here, whether it's we're talking about the fuels or caffeine, it's just having a time to monitor what, how it's affecting you so that you can then refine and change. And I think one of the things that I always talk about is just having a check-in each week, just a time where you spend 15 minutes, you know, maybe in a cafe or somewhere to review what's happened the week before. Now, what you might be reviewing, Bongan, is you might be reviewing your strategy around the caffeine. You might say, well, I tried my caffeine at this time. How did I feel? I actually felt, I felt reasonably good. You know, I might keep that in place for next week. Or there might be other challenges around your nutrition. So I think for me, we really need like the glue in our week to really be at one with our nutrition to refine, but then also to plan for the week ahead. So that let's say the wheels came off this week and you had a bad week, you were very busy with work traveling up and down the country, one bad week doesn't become two. Yeah. I think the wider point there, James, for me is um, it's really this whole issue of time and connection between the things we do with our body and how we feel. And I, and I, I write about this a lot in The Stress Solution, actually, about how, you know, the modern world for many of us has, has stolen time from us and we're just reactive. We, we get up, we're straight on our phones, we're just reacting all day, all day. And, and often it doesn't finish till we're, you know, we're still lying in bed reacting to what's going on in the world. Mm. And often that's seven days a week and we've, we've lost, you know, we, we need to take a bit of time to actually reflect, reflect yeah. on, yes, our nutrition, how we felt during the week, what activities we did that made a difference to the way we feel, what was good, what wasn't so good, what would we like to change in the following week and go, hey, this worked well, that didn't work so well. Yeah. Um, so I really like that actually, a really important part, you know, sort of journaling your progress and actually making time to understand what's working for you. Uh, I think that's a great tip. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, you know, I completely agree. And, you know, the point that you mentioned there as well is it can be paper. I'm sort of sat here looking at my paper, my paper pad. You know, it can be something that if you're on your phone a lot, I, I prefer just to use a paper pad. Me I too. Have, you know, it's 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 a, it's a different feeling. And if it gets you off of your phone for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, James, look, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Actually, there's so much more I could talk about. So maybe we'll have to save that for part two. We'll have to do another one in, in a few <laughs> months, if that's okay, if I, can, if I can get some time in your schedule. But I think the book's fantastic. I think it's a very refreshing approach. I think it's, you know, you've got such a high level of expertise from the people you have worked with. I think we can all learn um, from, from, from your approach. I think if we go into it certainly with an open mind and recognize that the, the results you have managed to achieve with some very high performing athletes, business people, clients, musicians, I think there's a lot that we can all learn in our own lives from that. So thank you for taking the time to write that book. Um, James, this, this, this podcast is called feel better, live more, because I believe that when we feel as good as we can feel, we get more out of our lives, yeah. work, relationships, pleasure, all sorts of things. So I wonder if you might be able to come up with a few tips right at the end of this podcast mm. to inspire people listening. What sort of changes do you think they can make immediately in their lives, which is going to you know, change the way that they feel? So I don't know if you've got three or four top tips for my listeners. Okay, yeah, so top tips to finish. Yeah, I, I guess it, it all starts with the goal, right? Um, everything we've said today has been goal orientated. So I would say the first step is to this weekend, get your pen and your pad out and write down your goal yeah. and really write down the motivation and the rationale behind that, you know, why it's important. And I think most importantly with it, you know, with any goal, you know, we're in the, we're in the winter months now, is it going to get you out of bed? You know, on a cold February morning, is that goal strong enough? Is that hook uh, strong enough for you to make a change? So I think that once you have a goal and the motivation, you can then start to be a bit more prescriptive with how you train your body and how you eat. So it allows us to then, you know, goes on to the next part, which for me, I'd say number two is to get your dose each day, your dose of exercise. For some people, they might be quite specific with their training and it might be their dose of either strength or resistance training or their cardio. For other people, their dose might just be increasing their step count and yeah. getting out and being active. It will mean different things to different people, but it's just, I think, making time in the day. And I think often sometimes treating this as a health appointment. Yeah. You know, actually have it, you know, our meetings will be in our diary. Can we not put our our 30 minute run, you know, in the diary that's immovable? Schedule it in so it's a part of your day, a fixed part of your day. It is there. No one can touch it. Don't feel guilty about not taking calls. Don't take emails. That's your time. 
because your your point right at the top was investing time in you so you don't get burnt out that is an investment for sure yeah that's a great tip any more um and i would say well, it's back to what we've discussed the whole way through uh really wrong and it's just looking at fueling depending on your demands so i think one of the things that people can apply straight you know straight away is that days where they're more active you know having more fuel having more uh, lower gi carbohydrates but i think if you're stuck behind the desk at work and you're not training for let's say two or three days which will happen you're not exercising a lot i think it's just being conscious and saying look my body doesn't need that amount of fuel i can maybe go to more of these maintenance type meals with a bit more protein and a, you know a, a bit more vegetables because my fueling needs are less and Jane. change the days James, I love those tips. I think those three tips are, are, are fantastic. Really great take-homes for people. Um, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Good luck with the book, and um, hopefully, I'll get you. I'll, hopefully, I'll get you on again soon. Oh, it'll be a pleasure. And you know, thanks again, uh, Wangun, for having me on. And congratulations for the podcast too. My pleasure. Thanks.